Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here in Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. We have uh, with with us today a very special show. And this show, we're hoping that will actually will change lives and will bring about uh, some 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 true change in justice and. Changes in in how we actually look at the innocent versus the guilty. Um, in this next uh, interview, I'm going to be talking with uh, Gilbert King, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author. Um, in a case that is truly like like no other, Leo. Leo Schofield maintained his innocence and he sits behind bars for this murder while for a murder while Jeremy Scott confessed but never was charged for it and this sta- this case is is sitting in the state of Florida and The state of Florida believes neither of them. Jeremy Scott did, while he has confessed, the state of Florida doesn't want to review the murder the murder trial and and match things up to to see if Jeremy actually did do it. Nor do they want to review the case so that they can discover if Leo Schofield is innocent of all charges. So let us sit and talk to Gilbert King about this very interesting case and how the state of Florida is handling it and the injustices that, that could very well be be happening right in this in, in the very courtrooms of the state of Florida. Three, two, one. Welcome to the show, Gilbert. Um, and you've been a journalist for a long time. So what got you started down this road anyway? Well, you know, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me, first of all. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a roundabout story. I don't have a traditional story to, to leap into this kind of work. Um, I really studied writing in college, but I ended up getting a job with a magazine company. And um, very quickly, er, they moved me into the photography department. And I kind of liked that. And so I stayed in the photography for a couple of years, learning about it and going on photo shoots for the magazines. And then I got so into it that I decided to become a photographer. And that's what I did for like 20 years. And I kind of missed my writing background. And, um, you know, after a while, I said, you know, what? I always wanted to go in this way. And I kind of got derailed by this photography career. And so I started, um, you know, working on some other projects, just doing some freelance writing. And um, before long, I, I just um, started doing some work for a book publisher um, where they, you know, were, were wanted me to do some ghost writing for, for various authors. A lot of them were celebrities who, you know, maybe just wanted to go on the Johnny Carson show or whatever with the book, but they didn't want to actually write the book. <laughs> and so that's <laughs> where I sort of came <laughs> Um, which was actually a really great experience to learn about writing and learn about storytelling because you're really writing someone else's story and you don't have the pressure to carry it for yourself. And so I, I started working with various, you know, all sorts of different fields from science to sports to history, um, going back and forth. 
And and I remember the publisher said to me at one point, like, don't you have any of your own book ideas like sitting around? And I, I said, no, I don't. And I realized what an opportunity. This is a publisher that's willing to publish one of my ideas and I didn't have anything ready for him. And, and so I started looking into it and I found this case in Louisiana uh, about a, a young man who was um, young black man who was um, sent to the electric chair in 1946 had a traveling electric chair that went from parish to parish to execute um, inmates. And um, this, on this particular case, uh, he, he survives his own execution. They didn't have enough electricity because the electrocutioners were drunk and hooked the chair up improperly. And so I got so much into this case, investigating it and finding out what really happened. Was he guilty? Was he not guilty? And it became a very big Supreme Court case um, about cruel and unusual punishment here in the US. And, uh, and that just got me hooked into the wrongful conviction space. And, 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 and that's really what jumpstarted me into, into writing. Yeah, I was going to, I was, that was going to be my, my, my next question is how, how you wound up in the injustice and, in and writing uh, human rights pieces like that, uh, like w w what we're going to talk about. Um, yeah. So that was like the, the, the opening was all, all happened all in one ball of wax there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did that when when you actually started working on that, how how did that how did that actually make you feel about um, about what you what you were doing? You know, it was a great awakening to go down to Louisiana and just research this case and meet people. And mm -hmm. what it really gave me was a broader understanding of this sort of pre-civil rights movement that I was really interested in, you know, the, the areas of the 40s and the 50s, you know, before Martin Luther King came along, what was happening in the United right. States uh, in terms of, you know, racial policy and, and you know, the lynching problems. And, and it was just a great education. And, you know, I really regret it because I didn't study it in school, but I spend the next 20 something years of my life really studying this, this era. I was really curious about it because you don't really hear so much about it in, in, in US history. And I think part of the reason is it doesn't really fit what we call the American narrative. You know, we like to think, well, of course, you know, we started out with slavery and the original sin, but then Abe Lincoln came along and fixed all that. And, you know, then we went back to some Jim Crow laws for a hundred years, but then Martin Luther King came along and well, there's a hundred years in American history that people don't want to talk about because it's so abhorrent. Um, yeah. And, you know, beginning at the very end of reconstruction up until the 1960s, well, there's like, you know, almost a hundred years in there where we're not really familiar with what was happening in this country. And, and I don't think it really fits our understanding of, of this American narrative. I often um, do these talks where I, I show those iconic Jim Crow images of like the separate water fountains that you would see in textbooks. And I, I think a lot of people look at those and think, oh, that was really, you know, not very proper. That wasn't very polite for African-Americans. Like, and I, my, my thinking was after doing all this research is like, you know, impolite is not the word I would use to describe what I was finding in the Jim Crow South. It was more like racial terrorism and brutality. And so I thought that those images of the separate you know, water fountains and the separate entrances really kind of whitewashed American history. And I thought the things that I was finding were just so much more violent and, and so much more like racial terrorism as opposed to this impoliteness of, of separate water fountains. And so that really bothered me. And I just felt we didn't know enough about those stories. Yeah. And there's a wealth of these kind of stories that I wanted to really dive into. Yeah. Um, well, well, some of the stories that you're talking about it inspired, um, I think it was uh, just a couple months ago that uh, President Joe Biden and um, and Vice President Harris uh, introduced and got passed a uh, a anti lynching bill. Uh, so, uh, I yeah. would you you telling telling these stories must must have helped some. Um, even, even if it wasn't directly that it had to help some telling some of these stories about uh, about lynchings and, and the injustices there. But um, if now we're on the topic of injustice. That's why we're here today uh, to talk about um, an injustice in Florida. Right. Right. And, you know, it's funny, the last two projects that I worked on, my last two books were in this area of central Florida and. 
I think what happened is like I end up going down there and speaking so much that I end up meeting so many people. And, and you know, Florida is a huge state. Uh, it's the third biggest in, in America these days. And uh, a lot of things go wrong in Florida and people are willing to talk about them. And so it's sort of this really fertile ground for me to go into, not just because of my context, but because there's so many injustices coming out of Florida. And, and you know, Michael, we don't really think about Florida when we think about like the Jim Crow South. I mean, a lot of times we look at Florida and they go, well, that's not really the South. It's got is Miami, it's an international. Well, you know, yeah. Florida, people don't realize this, but in the, in the early part of the 20th century, Florida was the most dangerous state to be black in. Uh, it had the highest um, per capita rate of lynching than any other state in the United States. And so people don't normally associate Florida with the same kind of, you know, oh. South that you might see in the cotton belt South, of like, you know, Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama. They just think it's Florida is like some separate state that's kind of South of the South. Um, but that was not my finding. I was finding just as much, you know, legalized slavery and and these kind of injustices right. and and i was just really really interested in this ground and and so people come up to me and tell me stories and a lot of times they are really impressive stories well um well uh this particular story about uh a gentleman who was jailed for um for a murder he didn't commit it it, it, it just kind of somebody passed you a, a note or a business card right and yeah, exactly. I had a, 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 I was I was doing a talk for a judicial conference, and one of the judges came up to me and gave me a business card. And you know, I I, I was signing books at the time. I looked at the back, and it had the name Leo Schofield, and it said, "Not just wrongfully convicted, he's an innocent man." And I thought, wow, judges are not supposed to say these kinds of things. You know, they have these um, yeah. judicial conduct uh, guidelines, and they're not supposed to do this. Um, so I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to look into this. And I called him a couple of days later. We started talking about it. And he was just like, I can't let this go. I know how this guy was railroaded. He's an innocent man. And I'm just going to speak up about it. And I might as well tell it to you. And so that was really what started. That was um, four years ago um, that I got that note. Yeah. So I mean, how, many, how often does this has actually happened in, uh, in, in the United States is like, you know, uh, I know right now I'm, I'm 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 actually broadcasting from from Canada, but uh, but I still have lots of family. I have uh, a good number of my friends are still in the United States, and we do travel back and forth a lot, right? So, I mean, how often does this happen in some place that, that's supposed to that flag stands for justice? That's the narrative, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, that, that was part of the appalling thing was that just going into this world and seeing how many wrongful convictions there really are and how easy it is. I don't want to say easy, but it's not as hard as you think to convict an innocent person. Um, and, and so when I started looking into this, I was looking at the Florida statistics. Um, since the Supreme Court reintroduced the death penalty in 1976, Florida has now executed 99 people. In that same time period, they've also fully exonerated 30 people. So that means for every three people that the state of Florida executes, they release one of them from death row because they were wrongfully convicted. That seems like an extraordinary high amount um, of, of wrongful convictions. I mean, it's just 30 people in, in those since 1976. And, and, and you have to keep in mind, Michael, that these are cases that they're capital cases. So when you're appealing, because they're death penalty cases, you have much greater you know, legal representation. Um, you have much more um, appeals available to you. So the cases are looked at much more closely. Uh, but you, know, you look at the average uh, homicide case that doesn't rise to a capital case, or just you know, even some of these robbery cases, drug cases, they, they have to happen a lot more than the percentage that we're seeing for death penalty cases. Well, so there's really no telling them, you know. Yeah. It, well, death penalty cases are, are a very narrow percentage of convictions. Right. Absolutely. And, and you know, like it takes a very long time in the United States to wind your way through all of those appeals and to finally get a death warrant where you actually have a date. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine like at that point you have – you know, some of these white shoe firms from New York City stepping in and volunteering pro bono to represent. Right. Um, you have places like the Innocence Project, the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. You know, if you have a death penalty case, you're getting attention. 
but a lot of cases don't draw that kind of attention. And those are the cases I was really interested in, the ones that just don't get the kind of scrutiny that we've come to expect in the American criminal justice system. Yeah. And um, I can imagine, I mean, everybody talks about DNA testing, forensics testing, and all that, all this other stuff that happens in these labs. We see the program CSI and all, all that stuff, right? And how easy it is for a tech to misplace a decimal point or, or, or something like that. And, and then it gets interpreted by the investigators the in a way that now the, the, the mountain of evidence has appeared against a guy that he didn't do it. <laughs> right. And, you know, like most cases, you know, come down to like mistaken identity. That's when you see the most exonerations, just a witness with an identification that's just incorrect. Um, and you see a lot of, of cases like that, especially when they go to DNA and they say, you know, you might've said you were positive and you saw this guy do it, but the evidence, the scientific evidence says differently. And so people's memory that people's, you know, they're, they're terrified a lot of times. It's really hard to do a really accurate um, identification. And when somebody's life is on the line and maybe there's only one witness, things can go wrong. Um, and we see that a lot in, you know, sexual assault cases where, you know, the woman is, you know, young, terrorized, and, and, you know, maybe she gets a little pressure from the police or from the prosecutor to, does it, doesn't he kind of look like this? Doesn't, is that the person, don't you think? And, yeah. you know, that's suggestive, you know, bias, I, I guess you'd call it, but um, yeah, it's, you can see how it goes wrong. And, and, you know, especially in cases where I'm looking at was before DNA. So there's like, you know, they didn't know how to preserve evidence. They didn't know exactly how to analyze it. They discarded it. They disposed of it. And so sometimes there's nothing left of any kind of DNA evidence. And unfortunately, the courts are balanced in a way now where, you know, you really need that DNA evidence. It's like the, the sort of holy grail of exonerating evidence. And if you don't have it, sometimes the courts just don't look at you the same yeah. way. Well, I, I know it, the, the saying is in, in the United States that you're innocent until proven guilty. Hey, now you've been proven guilty, but the but you're innocent. So how do you flip that around? Yeah, that's the <laughs> that's the, you know, the number one question because you know you have this presumption of innocence in a trial, but once you're convicted, now you're guilty unless proven innocent, and you really have to move mountains in order to get some kind of post post conviction relief. Um, and I think you know this particular case is a perfect example of it. It has everything you would think that would lead to someone's exoneration and still the state of Florida will not let him out of prison. And I think that is the most disturbing part of this case. And, and part of the, case, the reason I really got involved in this is because I just felt it was not investigated uh, properly. And I wanted to go in and go look at it and, and kind of start from scratch the way a lot of conviction integrity review units do. They just start from scratch and say, Forget about the appeal deadlines. Forget about all that. Let's just start from scratch, re-interview witnesses, because we think that there might be a, a, a wrongful conviction. Yeah. Okay, so so that sounds like a, a serious process. How does how does that actually work? How do you how do you go about that? Well, yeah, it, it's you know, and it's also like you're not a writer. You're a writer. You're not a law enforcement official. You're not a, a prosecutor. So I can't subpoena people and say you have to talk to me. It's it's sort of a song and dance, and you really you know, there's a lot of people that are very hesitant to talk about, to talk. And then there's other people who don't want to talk to the police anymore. They don't want to talk to the prosecutors. And they're like, well, I know something and they, they never listen to me. And, and so you, you get both sides of it. Um, you know, hmm. in this particular case, when this just told me that this guy was innocent, you know, I'm still skeptical, even though, you know, he's a, you know, totally legitimate uh, politically appointed judge in Florida. Um, you know, I'm still having some areas of skepticism because I don't know him that well, and I don't know the case that well, and so I really want to start from scratch and start reading. And so I started, in this particular case, the judge told me, it was very, very common sense oriented. He goes, don't believe me. I wouldn't believe me either. Do me a favor. Just read the trial transcript and tell me what you think. And that was sort of the deal that I had with him because I couldn't promise him that I would take on this case without knowing more. He just kind of challenged me to read the trial transcript. And he said that was what hooked me into believing that this guy was innocent. Um, and I started reading the trial transcript and uh, I started to see problems from the very start and all the way through to the state's closing rebuttal argument. Uh, I just thought that this case was 
I thought this guy was innocent of that um, alone. But, you know, there's a lot of innocent people in, in prison. And I wanted to find out, you know, well, what actually really did happen? And that's where I sort of had to do my own investigation. Yeah. So um, at the at the end of it, what what is the, the ultimate narrative? What happened? You know? Yeah. Well, you know, here, here's the thing. So I'll, I'll give you this is a, a 20, a 22 year old heavy metal guitarist from Lakeland, Florida. Um, and he's 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 married to an 18 year old girl by the name of Michelle Schofield, waitress at a local bar. Um, back in 1987, she just does not show up from her shift. She says she's on her way home and never makes it home. And so Leo Schofield goes out for the next three days with friends and family and they're searching and searching. And finally, they find three days later, they find her body in a, in a phosphate drainage canal in Lakeland, Florida. Um, but they don't have any physical evidence. The husband, you know, Leo has been out with friends and family. He's got an alibi the whole time. Um, and so the state is believing him that he didn't do this. They're trying to find the killer. And then they start canvassing the area and they find a witness who claims that she saw Leo uh, hearing a scream from inside the trailer across the street. And she says she saw Leo carrying something heavy out to the car, uh, presumably a body that he was trying to dispose of. Uh, and so that that wit eyewitness testimony was really the only piece of evidence they had against Leo. Um, and so, you know, I started investigating that, and trying to investigate who was this woman, what was her witness, and found out she constantly changed her story. She was telling the police one thing. Depending on which police officer she talked to, her story would be different. When she got in trial, her story didn't even match up from, you know, direct examination to cross-examination. And then she was contradicted by her own sister-in-law, who basically said, yes, we both saw uh, Leo carry something heavy, but that was two weeks before Michelle disappeared. And so, but suddenly that evidence um, became the, you know, main evidence against Leo Scopio. We got him convicted. Wow. So that, that, that even sounds a little, you know, when you're talking about uh, contradictions and things like that you know his sister saying no that was weeks ahead of that sort of thing it, right it's like how do you right. how do you get that in front of a, a jury of 12 people and you know it's funny if you don't have a good defense attorney who can really make this argument and make it clear to the jury that they the state's number one witness was just contradicted by the state's number two witness in such a dramatic way you know that's all well and good the, the, the interesting thing about this particular case is that there were fingerprints that were found in the car that Michelle was driving that were never identified. And they never had the um, what's called the APHIS system, the automatic fingerprint identification system. Yeah. That didn't come into existence for a couple of years. Um, so there was these unidentified fingerprints sitting in this car for 17 years that they did not identify until they ran the print before and they came back and matched a man who was in another prison convicted her who had murdered multiple people and happened to live about a mile away from the restaurant where michelle disappeared and so now they have this new evidence these fingerprints that are matching basically a convicted murder to this crime scene um and that wasn't enough the state just said well it could have been a coincidence he could have been breaking into the car and that was the story this kid came up with at the time. That Oh, yeah, that's why my fingerprints were there. I, I broke into that car and stole the stereo. Well, uh, several years later, this guy actually confessed and, and said that, yes, I did it. I lied about it. Um, they promised the state said they were going to help me with my parole, but they never did. So now I'm going to tell the truth. I did it. Here's how I did it. And I, I went and interviewed him in prison. And, uh, you know, it was fascinating because he had details that nobody else would know unless you were that person, things that really weren't released to the general public. He right. described it perfectly. We, um, you know, went and found his girlfriend, found some of his old friends, and you could see that he was very familiar with the place that where Michelle's body was found. He used to take other girlfriends there and, you know, sexually assault them. And, and so he was connected to the car. He was connected to the place. And now he was admitting that he did it and so that was really when the investigation started to take off and we really started digging into who he was 
because it didn't make sense to us that Leo Schofield actually committed this crime. But then when you look at this Jeremy Scott person whose fingerprints match, it totally looks like him. And then he admitted it and he's forensically tied to the crime scene. What more do you need? Um, and that's sort of the, the process that we went through. Like once you hear this story and hear all the people that we talked to, you're gonna know what happened in this case. And it's not the same as what the state thinks happened. And that's why Leo Scopio is still in prison today. Yeah. Well, is there a, I, I, I shudder to think that there would be a political reason why we need to keep keep uh, his conviction on the books, is there, you know, because there's some elected official that, hey, I, I need the, my, my conviction rating to stay high so that I look good to the public. Absolutely right. That's exactly it. And, and it's like the state is very stubborn about looking at these cases. They're like, we got our conviction. A jury has spoken. You know, we got it right. There's no need to fix this. And, and the problem is, is that's not always the case. You know, you see like sometimes, you know, surgeons go into surgery and they'll lose somebody on the table that maybe they shouldn't have lost. Something went wrong. Well, there's an investigation into that. You can't right. just the, the surgeon can't say, well, look, you know, we, I got it right. I don't know what happened here. It's over. You know, and when a plane falls out of the sky, um, there's an investigation. You can't just, you know, just say we're not going to look into that. You want to do it because you want people to be safe. Uh, but for some reason, when it involves lawyers looking at their own work, and they're the, they're the first to, you know, obviously sue the hospitals and the airlines. If <laughs> yeah, wrong. Yeah. They, they don't want their work looked at. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And, and so that that is one of the most disturbing things. Like, protecting a conviction is something you hear constantly. It's because if you go back and overturn this and maybe uncover some corruption on the part of a prosecutor, well, then they're going to start looking at all of their cases. Every time this case, they're going to look at him and make sure he right. didn't cut any corners and break any rules. And, and so that it's really important to do that. And you can see why some prosecutors are really resistant to this because there's electoral consequences to that. Yeah. So, so, so there we there we have it. That Leo Schofield still sitting in jail, and um, somebody else, Jer Jeremy Scott, uh, 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 confessed. They have they have the confession. They have have the the evidence, and and that I I would suppose that Jeremy Scott's fingerprints would match, and and um and nothing's being done about it. So, um, so oh, it's, it's like the whole thing is dead, and you know. yeah. So, so uh, I know know that you're you're doing a, a big uh, a big um, broadcast about this, and you've gotten some some other uh, really really big uh, broadcast names involved in this. Um, that what's the ultimate goal? To, to, is it to get um, is it get Leo out, or is there a bigger message there? You know, it's interesting because, um, you know, obviously, as somebody who's just a storyteller, I just want to put this story out there and, and see what the reaction is to it. You know, I feel like I, I always felt the state had an incorrect narrative, and my goal was to correct the narrative. And, you know, it, it involved four years of my life. And, you know, we put together this podcast, but I think what's really interesting about, about the investigation is that you know, I started doing this correspondence with Jeremy Scott in prison. I think he was, you know, he was locked up in solitary confinement. He'd never really talked to anybody before. So mm -hmm. I kept st sending him like, you know, stamps and paper and, and, and just said, you know, this is what I'm working on. If you want to talk to me, I'm here. I want to hear what you have to say. And he ignored the first few letters I sent. And seven months went by and he started writing to me. And I could tell he was just bored and had time on his hands. It was during COVID. And, um, you know, he started mentioning some other murders that he never got caught for. <laughs> and so, like, we had time on our hands, so we started investigating them. And, and sure enough, we found another murder that we're, you know, we, we were absolutely convinced that he was responsible for. And he brought it up out of the clear blue. He, he just said, I can tell you about the taxi cab driver that I killed, too. And, you know, when we started talking to him, he knew everything about that case, stuff he should never have known, stuff the police didn't know, a lot of details. Um, I went into the, the sheriff's office and the state attorney's office and they didn't want to pursue it. And so I said, well, now you better wait for the podcast because um, it's going to be newsworthy. You know, we, we think right. we've solved a 35 year old unsolved cold case murder. 
And it's going to look pretty bad that you didn't really act on this when I came into you with this evidence. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I obviously I've gotten so involved in this and I care so much about Leo and, and believe in his story so much that I don't want him sitting behind bars. I want to see him out there. But, you know, as a storyteller, I only have so much that I can do. And then it sort of has to get turned over to some other people who can maybe make a difference. And that's what's happened before in some of the cases I worked. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. As a, as a fellow storyteller, hopefully we tell a good enough narrative that <laughs> it compels some action, yeah. right? So, right. It's the only thing you can hope for. I mean, uh, the 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 the, one, the last one I had an experience with it, and it really sort of influenced me. Was I was working on um, the story of the Grove and Four and Devil in the Grove, and uh, you know, it was another Central Florida case back in 1949. Thurgood Marshall was actually the lawyer for the defense. Wow. Um, but yet these men, yeah, and these <laughs> men were convicted, um, sentenced to death, and then the sheriff started executing them on the way back to the trial, way back to the courthouse. Um, and so I, I went in and spent five years on this case, investigated it, found a lot of evidence that had not been seen before. And once the book got published, you started to see some like momentum build uh, and, and, and people wanted to do something about it. And, and so just last year, 2021, 72 years after these initial crimes that these guys were wrongly uh, accused of, the state of Florida actually stepped in and exonerated these four men posthumously uh, just last year. And so having gone through that and having been around so many people who cared to correct this injustice, it's been really inspiring to me. And so I, I really hope that that happens for Leo too. I mean, to me, it's like this story is so obvious that he was wrongfully convicted and he's not responsible for this crime. And I just, to, for him to spend another day in jail, to me, is just a, a tragedy. Yeah, yeah. It, I agree. I agree that 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 is the, the ultimate tragedy. And, and he's been in jail for how long now? Uh, about 35 years. Um, wow. And, and the, the horrible thing about it, Michael, is he could have been out a long time ago. He was offered you know, immunity deals and, and, and really short sentences because the state was not very confident in their case. They didn't really have any evidence against them except this one eyewitness, which she later turned out to be not credible. Um, but he could have been out of prison, you know, back in the early 90s um, based on, you know, no, having no prior offenses, getting a second degree murder charge uh, back and then when the sentencing was done. So he could have been out of there a long time ago, but he said, I cannot be guilty to anything that would be a lie. And so even when he comes up for parole, um, they keep holding this over his head. He's never apologized. He's never uh, shown any remorse for the murder. And he says, I cannot, I have a claim of innocence. I am not gonna show remorse for a crime I did not commit. And so when you hear that and see that and the commitment, that's one, one thing to say, but another thing to spend 35 years in prison uh, living that principle. Yeah, definitely a man of principles. If he, um, in, I guess in some in some respects, he is like, I guess some some would say that it's, oh, he he's there's something wrong with him that he would that he wouldn't just confess and take and take the the easy way back out again, but on the other hand, is like when you're sticking to your principles, you know. Yeah. You know, it's really sad because he's, he, you know, he, he has a daughter, he got married again in, in prison and has a, a an adopted daughter. And, you know, he tells a story of her being 12 years old and just saying, you know, daddy, come home. We, won't, we just want you home. And he says, those are the moments that he feels like I would do anything for my daughter. Um, but that he ultimately comes back to say it would be wrong to confess to this. And it would be wrong for his wife. You know, the, the memory of his wife and justice for his wife, for him to admit to killing her when he didn't, he just can't live with that himself. And and so, you know, I can tell you this guy is like, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just a man of his convictions. And he just says, it's easier for me to stay in prison um, than it is to admit to something I didn't do. I couldn't live with myself if I did that. Yeah. 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 I, it, it, I guess you, you can't know what you would do until you're there. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, that's the thing I don't know. Like, you know, and, and you think about it, the prison system is full of people who take the pleas because they're afraid of going to prison and getting the stronger sentence. So, you know, if, if, if you did commit something and you want to risk going to trial, you might serve 15 years. But if you take the plea, you might get out in six months. 
And so that's appealing to the majority of the accused. I think something like 96% of cases, criminal cases in the United States are, you know, pleas. Uh, and so the system doesn't have enough money and time to try everybody. They depend on these plea systems to keep the number of trials down. And so you're incentivized with much lighter sentences. Um, and, but, you know, he just could never do it from the start and he won't do it today. He won't even do it for parole. Um, you know, he could, he could easily, he's a perfectly, he's the kind of the perfect inmate, you know, he's like absolute like legend in the prison. He's, you know, he's never had any real infractions. He's just a great person. He runs the God behind bars prison ministry and this, and he's a mentor to so many people there. Um, but you know, he, he, he just, he just cannot, this is something he cannot do. And uh, that, that's one of the things I, when I finally met him, I'm, you know, yeah. there's a lot of people that you know, are blown away by his personality and his commitment to something like this. Yeah. All right. Well, um, when's the, when when is the uh, the big broadcast going to happen? Is it September 23rd? Uh, September 21st is the first two episodes of Bone Valley will be released, mm -hmm. um, and then there'll be one 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 per week after that. Um, but if you if you sign up to um, to uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, and, and, and subscribe to Lava for Good podcast, uh, you can get the episodes a week early, commercial free. Um, uh, so, but but the, the, the first two episodes will, will be released on September 21st. Uh, it should be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, it's, it's been, been enlightening, uh, to say the least. Um, and I hope that it, the whole project does, does some good for our society on that one. Um, oh, thanks, Michael. It's really nice of you, and thank you for yeah. having me on. I really appreciate yeah. It. And and any time you want to want to come back with, with another project, um, it, be more than happy to have you. <laughs> so that's great. I would love to come back and, and give you an update that he's been released from prison and fully exonerated, and we'll do a follow up episode. <laughs> that would be great. Yes, I love 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 to do that kind of a follow up. So yeah. Okay. Well, we'll keep that in mind. I hope it happens. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. We hope to hear from Gilbert in the future with a update that over release has been made and the courts reverse their decision and exonerate uh, Mr. Schofield uh, of all charges. We also want to thank um, Culture Spun PR Systems out of New York City for helping bring us and Gilbert together to do this special. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.